Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God loves you, but the question that we have to answer is this. Is the love of God going to have any positive impact on your life? In this world and in the age to come, and of course I'm speaking about the kingdom of God. Simply because God has a great and perfect love for you, He truly loves you. But that does not mean that there's going to be any change, any benefit, any good that happens to you because God has love for you. See, you will only benefit from the love of God if you are in a covenantal relationship with Him. Until you enter into, specifically, the new covenant, the covenant that was ratified and established by the blood of Messiah, until you enter into that specific covenant, the love of God will not produce anything that is comforting, helpful, desirous in your life. So all too often people hear, God loves me. And they think that they can take solitude in that. They're comforted by that. And they ought not be. Because unless they have received that gospel message, that love of God, they will never experience in any way nor the benefit of that love. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 20. Psalm 20 is a, a short psalm, but it is full of much wisdom. There is great revelation for us in a practical sense so that we can act in a way that brings about the will of God in our life. And that is what should interest you that you are a person that is behaving in a way that God's will will be done. If you're not interested in the will of God, then you're not interested in God. And if you believe that you have a relationship with Him, that you have a hope, if you're not interested in God's will, then you have been deceived. You have followed into wrong teaching. So let's begin Psalm 20, we find that the first verse is simply that short inscription, at least in this psalm. And what will be your first verse in the English and in most other languages is actually verse 2 in the Hebrew. Let's begin. We read, We should be very familiar with that by now to the chief musician, to the choir director, the leader of worship that is going to be utilizing this psalm. So David, we know that it's a Mizmor le David, meaning a psalm of David. So he addresses it to that one who's going to be leading worship. And let me simply say that if your worship is not utilizing the Psalms, then your worship is not what God wants it to be. The book of Psalms, this book is foundational for bringing us into a proper worship experience with the living God through His Son, Messiah Yeshua. Now let's look at the next verse. There is something that we need to, to realize in how we should render the, the future, what many people call the Hebrew imperfect tense. And that is whether we should understand it at times as the optative. The optative in Greek and in other languages 
is the, the grammatical construction that speaks of a desire, a want, or something that, that you wish would be the case. And it's oftentimes translated may. May God bless me. May the Lord equip you. May the Lord help you. Things along those lines. And I would argue that, that in Hebrew, we don't have that grammatical construction. It's not may the God or I wish that God would do this, but rather in Hebrew, it is a proclamation. It is something that we should declare with faith and expectation. And that's what David is doing here. So we read, look again at this verse, verse 2 in Hebrew, verse 1 in English. We ought not translate it, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble, but rather we should translate it simply in the future by saying, the Lord he will answer you in the day of trouble. This shows a confidence in our God. And this is one of the purposes of this psalm, that we might approach God with confidence, having entered into a covenantal relationship with him. Therefore, we can expect to experience the love of God. Not just that God loves me, but I will benefit. His love will change me and my situation. So David is speaking with confidence, not simply a, a wish, not simply a, a hope, not something uncertain, but something that he is assured of. So he says, the Lord, he will answer you in the day of trouble. And why David is so convinced of that is that David has experienced God's help in times of trouble in his own life repeatedly. It is not something that is infrequent, but it's something that David has experienced consistently in his life, God's help. So God, he will answer you in the day of trouble. And then notice something else. Now, this psalm has much parallelism. One thing is parallel to another. And in this scripture, where it says, he will answer you, is parallel with the next phrase, which is, he will lift you up. Now, this is a word of protection, defense, but it has to do with placing you out of the reach in a different domain, in a different location than the enemy so that trouble will not come to you it's kind of like a silly example is that an animal's being chased but the animal who's being chased he can run up a tree but the one who is chasing him he's not equipped for that he's not designed for climbing trees so if that one that is being chased can get up into the tree, he's out of reach. He's in a different domain. And this is what David is saying God will do. He will lift us up. But notice, we have here something very important. Now, I would ask the question, if I was teaching this psalm in a seminary, in a theological institution, I would say, what is parallel? With, with the name of God here, Hashem, that yud He vav He, usually translated simply the Lord. And there's only one answer, and it's a series of words. It is the name of the God of Jacob. So in this psalm, in this verse, there is a parallel relationship between that sacred name of God, those four letters, yud He vav He, and what we read here where it says the name of the God of Jacob. There's something related between them. One is teaching us the proper understanding of the other. Now, the name has to do with character. I've said that so frequently, and it's not something that, that I coined or I discovered or I came up with. 
That is something that, that all theologians understand. That the Hebrew word Shem, name, oftentimes relates to character. And it's so significant that when we speak of the character of the Lord, He is being revealed here through the term, the God of Jacob. And again, I've mentioned this so, so frequently, and that is there is no hermeneutical or etymological relationship between the Hebrew root, which the name Jacob comes from, and anything related to deceit or lying or cheating, anything along those lines. And that's why we don't see frequently God of Abraham standing alone, that term God of Isaac standing alone. But we do see the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob coming together. But usually, when just one is mentioned, it's almost without exception. The God of Jacob. And the term Jacob has to do with pursuing, specifically pursuing the things of God. And when you grasp onto the things of God, there is victory. So this is the context. Verse 2 says, the day of trouble. I've got trouble and I want God to answer him to respond. And what do I want him to respond with? Victory. Providing for me, helping me pursue and obtain victory. And that's truly what the name Jacob or Yaakov is about. Next verse. He will send, not may he send, but rather he will send your help from the sanctuary. It's the word for the holy place. So God, he provides that help, that deliverance. He will act in order to move us up and away from the, the trouble and the source of that trouble. But it's significant that it's the term for a holy place. And this tells us holiness, what should come into your mind, and I certainly would expect by now that you would say purpose. Biblically, there's a relationship between holiness and the purpose of God. So it's when I am pursuing like Jacob did. The purposes of God, I can expect God to move in my life and send help. So David says, he will send your help from the holy place and from Zion, that is Zion, and realize the relationship here between from the holy place and from Zion. The holy place and Zion are parallel. And this sending your help goes along with the last part of our, of our verse, verse 3 in the Hebrew, verse 2 in English, and that is the word yisadecha, which is he will support you. And this word support, it's, it's used for, for helping one regain their health in modern Hebrew. You go to a rehabilitation center, someone that's going to nurse you back to health. They are going to support you. They are going to provide what's necessary for you to turn, get back to that proper situation, that proper uh, condition. And that's what God does for his people when they're in a covenant relationship with him. Next verse, verse 4 in Hebrew, 3 in English. He will, not may, but he will remember all of your gifts. This is the word mincha. Several times it can be translated a grain offering, but generally, in a generic way, it's speaking about a gift, these offerings to God. And, and this teaches us an important principle. When you make gifts to God, how do you do that? Well, there may be an organization, your local congregation, that you bless from time to time with, with gifts. Or you may bless someone else, someone who is in need, perhaps a stranger, whatever, by, by helping them, and you do it in the name of God. Just today, 
I was listening to an interview of, of a, a performer, had great deal of success. She's, she died a few years ago. And she spoke about, and she remembered it, and she died when she was 93. This was shortly before her death. And she was talking about when she was four and five years old, how there were neighbors that helped out her family and provided for her to, to go into the entertainment business, primarily singing and acting. And what we see here is that getting involved, that helping, assisted her in a physical pursuit. You can help people physically, but with a spiritual objective. And this is what we find when it speaks here about gifts. He will remember all your gifts and your burnt offerings. He says here, uh, he will receive Selah. No way to translate that last Hebrew word, Selah. But it speaks about an emphasis that God's faithful to remember and he is going to receive. Receive what is given to him or in his name for his purposes and to be a blessing to others. Verse 5 in Hebrew, 4 in English. He will give to you according to your heart. Now let me tell you what a false teacher does. Someone who likes to tickle ears, they understand this by saying, ah, God's going to give to you your heart's desires, what you want false. That is not the proper way to understand this. When he says he's going to give to you, if you look at this, it says here, kill vavecha, which means simply according to your heart. And the right way to perceive this passage is this. God is going to move according to your heart condition. Do you have a lev nechon, a correct heart? a heart that's established, a heart that is righteous, a heart that is pure. It is so unfortunate that people take verses like this and in order to sensationalize, please the, the audience, in order to get them to actually to manipulate them, they say things that the text does not imply. When we look at this verse, here again, the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. It says, he will give to you according to your heart and all your counsel. Now, be careful. This is not what it says, etzah. This is the word, etzah, literally counsel. But if you look at how it's used in other Psalms and in other places, it's really a word that speaks about Godly revelation in regard to his program, his objective. So the counsel of the Lord that he has for you teaches you about what your life should be, how you should live it, what the objectives are for you. So if your heart is committed to the counsel, your counsel here again, the source of your counsel is God. It is simply the program for your life. So he is going to move and behave. Notice what he says. And all your counsel he will fulfill. It's not what you conjure up in your mind, what you want, what you think is your destiny. Those are false teaching same. It's God's destination, God's purpose, God's objective for your life. That's what God will move and fulfill. And if your heart is not committed to God's objective for your life, God's going to simply move aside. You're not going to experience his help, his assistance, his support, his provision. You're going to be in a spiritual timeout. And what happens when, when that occurs in someone's life? Oftentimes, unfortunately, they begin to seek other sources for what they want and they believe it's God but they are being greatly deceived and instead of pursuing God's objectives for their life they're on an entirely different path pathway 
Verse verse six in Hebrew, five in English. Neranena. Now neranena is let us shout. It is a term of power and joy. And in the scripture, we see that these two concepts, power and joy, frequently go together. There's a, a verse from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8 and verse 10. You all know it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So when I have a joy that comes from God, that is going to empower me, that joy. And therefore, he says, verse, verse 6 in Hebrew, 5 in English, let us shout. It's a shout of joy. It's a shout of confidence. It's a shout that, that, that believes that the will of God is in a moment going to be fulfilled. Let us shout in your salvation. Who's he speaking to? God. It's God's salvation that we can experience. It's his victory that we can participate in. And in the name of our God, notice that, there is a relationship here between in your salvation and in the name of our God. Here again, when you look at this according to the laws of Hebrew parallelism, how to understand Hebrew poetry, there is, is nothing uncertain. It's not, well, this is your interpretation. Wrong. There are grammatical clues that confirm, not suggest, but confirm here. Because when you look at this, notice that we see in this verse the phrase ne ranena, let us shout. The last part of this first half is the word nidgal, let us raise the banner. Now you know that it's parallel because we are in the first person plural. They're both verbs. So when we look at the grammatical markings, there is not just something that's similar, but exact between these two words, niranena and nidgal. So they're parallel with one another. And then the phrase, beshuatecha, in your salvation, is parallel, ubeshem elohenu, the particle here it's a Hebrew preposition, be, goes with the word in your salvation and in, you hear that word in, in both, in your salvation and in your name are God. So salvation, remember, in the name of God, what's name? Character. Salvation. I can experience that. Not just that I'm saved, but I can experience salvation. Not simply the, the blessing, the privilege to enter into the kingdom of God. But now I can experience salvation, another aspect, a primary aspect. Didn't say the primary, but a primary aspect of it is the name of God. What does that mean? Living, behaving, thinking according to the character of God. That's salvation. So it's when I'm behaving like God in his character that I am experiencing, manifesting, testifying of the salvation I have received. Last part of our verse. And the Lord will fulfill all mishalotecha. And this is all your requests, all your desires. But here again, you say, well, isn't that good, good biblical Proof that he wants to give us our desires? Be careful. Remember what it says. First of all, there's a process in this verse. This verse has three components. The first has to do with rejoicing in salvation, the Lord's salvation that he shares and gives to us. And what is that salvation? To be in the character of God. We're going to lift up the banner that is, we're going to esteem, we're going to testify about the character of our God. And only when we are in that same character, then and only then can we expect the Lord to fulfill our desires, 
our request because there are going to be requests that are founded upon his character and have as a purpose his objectives. That's when God gives us the desires of our heart, not when we want foolish things that tickle our ears and please our flesh. That's why it's so important to be theologically correct. And the only way to be theologically correct is when we base our theology on Scripture and the right methodology for for learning the Scripture, how to study it. Verse 7. Verse 7 has another interesting characteristic because we have the word ata with an ayn, which is now. But then we have a word, and if you look, and here again, I prepare for these studies. And oftentimes, I want to know what other people are encountering because if, if I just share what's truth from the original language, sometimes there'll be a disconnect from you, the listeners, because you're looking at it in a translation. And sometimes the translations, because of the fact that, that people are flippant with the word of God, they are not, they're just rendering rather than bringing theological truth into their translation. And what I mean by that is, it says, let me read it in Hebrew, ata yadati. Now, I mentioned ata with an ayn because ata with an aleph, it sounds the same, pronounced the same, but doesn't mean the same. Because the letter ayn and aleph today in enunciating Hebrew we find that they have the same sound. There is a belief, and some of the, the Yemenite Jews, they are able to make a distinction between the Ain and the Aleph, but most cannot. So what we find here is the word Ata with an Ain doesn't mean you, but it means now. Now with a sense of, of urgency. There's another Hebrew word, at least in modern Hebrew, akshav, which is now, but from what I've been taught, the word atah has a greater sense of urgency. So most Bibles, you just check it out, most will say, now I know. But it doesn't say atah, yodea, but it says atah, yadati. What's the difference? Yodea would be in the present. I know. But here we have it in the past. <coughs> I knew. So now, and the reason for the past is that it speaks of it in a more complete, from a position of something in its entirety, something that is, is encompassing, all-encompassing. So David is saying, now I have known I, I understand and I know this, meaning I have come to this understanding. So now I have known that the Lord saved his anointed one, his Messiah. And again, it's the word Hoshia, not Moshia, Hoshia, which has to do with God making salvation. And it also speaks of something that is complete. So David is revealing here, and it has such theological implications. What does it mean? I mean, this would be shaking revelation. Because if your concept of Messiah is only this ruling king, this victorious warrior that comes and defeats the enemies of Israel and establish this kingdom where he's the king of and shares his victory with his coveted people. If that's the only thing that you know about Messiah, that concept. This verse has, has no relevance whatsoever. Because when it says, I know that he has saved his anointed, his Messiah, it speaks about Messiah being saved. And, and most New Testament believers understand this having to do with the deliverance that, that God brought upon Messiah when he raised him from the dead. 
So it's a resurrection hope that we have. That's our victory. Not a physical deliverance from the flesh, but a spiritual deliverance that has physical implications to it, whereby we overcome death. And overcoming death positions us for a kingdom experience. Second part of verse 7. He will answer him from his holy heavens. Now, this speaks about how, we go back to the previous verse, Ki Hoshia Hashem Mishicho, for the Lord has saved his Messiah. He will answer him, it's back in the future, he will answer him from his holy heavens. And how will he answer him? With powers. This is the same word that the angel Gabriel comes from. And Gabriel is a, a powerful angel. So he's going to answer, answer him with this power. And the term power here is in the plural to show abundance. And also the yesha, the salvation of his right hand. And this right hand also speaks about victory and integrity to a pre-described contract, agreement, expectation, something that, that, that was promised. That's what God does. God delivers, he saves based upon a covenantal promise. Verse 8 in, in Hebrew, 7 in English. This talks about now a alternative there are two alternative or two choices of life we could say one is based upon investing everything in this world the other is investing everything in god and there's really no position in between it's an all or nothing and what david is saying here ele these, some will say some, that's fine for our English understanding, but it's the word ele, these in chariot, these in horses. Now, horses and chariots speaks about physical, worthy power, military power. But look at the next part. Va'anachnu. Now, in modern Hebrew, we have the word aval. But I mentioned many times when we're studying from the New Covenant in the Greek language, this word day, which is a conjunction of contrasts. And the term the or ve, depending upon the grammatical use, it can be used as that conjunction of unity or a conjunction of contrast, depending upon the context. And here it's disunity. It is to show a difference, a contrast. Some ch ch trust in the physical, some in chariots, some in horses, but we, in contrast to that, we, who's we? Covenant people. We, here's what I love, third time, we, in the name of the Lord our God, we remember. Now, this word Remember is literally the word naskir, and it's a word to make mention of. So niskor would be, we remember, naskir is we make mention of. It's a testimony. And this word, liskor, in the root, shempoal, liskor, to remember. I've said repeatedly about every time this word comes up. It's a word that's related to God's covenant. So we are going to make mention. Some, when they have trouble, they, they go to the human power. They go to their physical, financial resources. But we are different than that. We, we make mention, we testify of our covenant hope in, notice what it says, in the name, in that character of the Lord our God. Verse, verse 9 in Hebrew, 8 in English. 
they bow down and fall. This word for bowing down can be they submit. That is, they are made to submit. It's a word that speaks about being defeated. They are defeated and they fall. But here again, but we, in contrast to that, but we rise up. And literally, it's the word come new. We have risen up. And then the next word, some English will say, we, we have been raised or we rise up or have raised up in an upright way. And that's true, but that's not what it says here. This is the word, look at it carefully. It is the word vanit odad, which speaks about two possibilities. Some argue that the, the root is od, which means again. Even though that we're put down, we're going to get up again and again and again and again. And ultimately, we have that great getting up, which is the resurrection. Now, the word, if I simply said the word oded, you know what would any Hebrew speaker would come up with? This is a word for encouragement. Notice the difference. Because we trust in the name of the Lord, because we make mention and testify of his covenant, therefore we, we have risen and we are going to be encouraged because of God's faithfulness. And now finally, the last verse, verse 10 in Hebrew, 9 in English. This is a, a verse, for example, Havdalah. As we conclude Shabbat, we, we do so with this, with this verse in the Havdalah prayers. It is a great verse. It's even fun to just read it in Hebrew. Adonai Hoshiah HaMelech Ya'anenu Be'yom Korenu, which means the Lord, He, he is saved. The king, he will answer us. Not may he, I hope he will, perhaps he will, but he will answer us in the day we call. Now, let me conclude this study with, with uniting the first verse, literally the second verse in Hebrew, and the last verse. When we began our study, we talked about he will answer, the Lord will answer you, in the day of trouble. And now we find the same phrase, he will answer us in the day we call. That's what we need to be. This is how we find help, how we're lifted up, how we receive all of those benefits when we call in the name of the Lord. He will answer us in that day that we call meaning he's not going to leave us nor forsake us. Let me conclude by this. Psalm 20. The more you study it and read it, memorize it, the more comfort, assurance, and confidence you will have in our God. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.